Hi, everyone. This is Angela Ciolana, one of the hosts of Journeys of Hope. Thanks so much for downloading this Pilgrim Center of Hope podcast. And we are so grateful to our sponsor who made this podcast possible in honor of Valentin, Nicholas, and Francisco Campos. If you also would like to join us as a missionary of hope in this mission, please visit pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Now, here is your journey of hope. Journeys of Hope, an introduction to the Universal Church that promotes an attitude of pilgrimage among the faithful by introducing you to pilgrim destinations around the world. Welcome to Journeys of Hope, your passport to sacred destinations around the world. This program, produced by Pilgrim Center of Hope, provides you with a virtual pilgrimage to all the places associated with the history of our church and written about in Scripture. You know, for the last 27 years, Pilgrim Center of Hope has led uh, over 70 authentic spiritual pilgrimages to various places throughout the world, including Holy Land, Italy, France, Spain, Greece, Turkey, Germany, Marian apparition sites, and beyond. Well, as a result of that, Journeys of Hope is able to take you to these holy sites so that you can learn about these various sites throughout the world as well as discover how their significance inspires us spiritually and in the knowledge of church history. I'm Mary Jane Fox, and thank you for joining me. My husband, Deacon Tom, and I are the co-founders and directors of Pilgrim Center of Hope, an evangelization ministry serving the church since 1993. Our mission is guiding people to Christ and the church. And Journeys of Hope is a production of Pilgrim Center of Hope. And our programs are available also on podcast and on our website, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Thank you for joining me on this journey. Today, I will take you on a pilgrim journey to Mount Tabor, located in the Galilee region in the Holy Land. My husband, Deacon Tom, and I have led many pilgrimages to the Holy Land. It's part of the ministry of pilgrimage uh, that we have under the umbrella of Pilgrim Center of Hope. And so we have been to the Holy Land 60 times uh, in the last 30 years. And with each time, of course, you learn so much more. And each time is so fresh because these holy sites are like entering into an eternal moment, walking into the Bible uh, story that each site represents. And today we're going to Mount Tabor. So today when you visit Mount Tabor, it's reliving the, the, the scriptures I'm not reliving, but, you know, stepping into the scripture story and really meditating, pondering, learning, discovering what that scripture is telling us. Not only us, but what Jesus wanted to tell us, the whole world. So let us, so that's why, you know, it's important for Pilgrim Center of Hope to have this ministry of pilgrimage. We're not a travel agency or um, tour company. We're, we're a ministry that organizes them so that the person who travels with us becomes a pilgrim and they really have an experience, time, and really you know, touching the sites and discovering the sites. So this is why we're so happy to be able to share what we've learned through the years with you here on Journeys of Hope. What occurred on Mount Tabor? For Christians, Mount Tabor is the holy mountain, the Mount of Transfiguration, where the transfiguration of Christ took place, where Jesus began to radiate light and converse with Moses and Elijah. This event is noted in three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. After roughly three years of public ministry, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up a mountain and revealed his glory to them. They had spent day after day with Jesus as he walked from town to town, preaching the gospel and calling sinners to repent. He told them many stories, spoke numerous parables, and worked shocking miracles in their midst. Despite the magnitude of these events, nothing quite prepared them for the moment 
when the glory of the Lord was revealed to them as on Mount Tabor. Let's hear the story as it is written in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 9. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up to a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, conversing with him. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Lord, it is good that we are here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud cast a shadow over them. Then from a cloud came a voice that said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell prostrate and were very much afraid. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and do not be afraid. And when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one else but Jesus alone. This is from the Gospel of Mark. Jesus revealed most clearly his divinity. And there are several points to take in from the Gospel for the Transfiguration. Scripture, the Gospels in particular, is interesting for the details it provides and also for the details it lacks. This Gospel tells us that the clothes of Jesus became white as light. There's a lot here. It describes how Jesus was transfigured, how the three, Peter, James, and John, responded, or what they, what they saw and what they felt, and also, what Jesus, uh, how Jesus responded to the three. He touched them and he said, rise and do not be afraid. So this is a moment where really the God the Father, his voice is heard, Jesus is, is glorified, and two prophets, Moses and Elijah, are beside him. This is an incredible, incredible experience that Jane, Peter, James, and John um, had. And that's why you can imagine why Peter would say, Oh, Lord, it is so good to be here. Haven't you had those moments where you've heard a scripture or you had a little revelation? It's like, oh, this is good news, whether it be spiritual or just family related. Um, and you think, I, this is so extraordinarily good. I'm so happy that I wish I could just stay in this moment. Well, you know, God is always with us at every moment. And this is what's so beautiful about the reality of God. God is, 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 exists and he's true. And so this reality that he exists and he is in the midst of these moments and even moments that are not so, so wonderful, he is still very present. Let's continue with the scripture. The three disciples see that Jesus is conversing with Elijah and Moses. And these are significant figures from the Old Testament. Before Jesus, everything known about God was revealed through the law and the prophets. So Moses represents the law because he gave us the Ten Commandments and Elijah, the prophets. And Jesus is above them because he is the fulfillment of God's revelation. In this vision, Moses and Elijah, along with Peter, James, and John, see the glorified face of God in the person of Jesus, as he will be after the resurrection. And in this vision, Jesus is above Moses and Elijah because he is the fullness of God's revelation. So Peter, understandably, wants to remain in this place and in that moment. He offers to make tents for the three figures conversing and expresses the goodness of being in that moment. To be with the Lord away from the crowds, and the rest of the disciples was one thing. But to be in the Lord's presence, fully aware that he is God, is an entirely different thing. And as I, you know, I, I just, something came to my mind. And I believe that when we walk into a church, whether the church, you know, there's no service, it could be dark, but we walk in and it is a consecrated building. It is the house of God. And when we walk into a Catholic church, 
it is the same really for us. You know, it's good to be away from the crowds and the rest of everything, whatever goes on in our lives. To be in the Lord's presence is completely a different thing. And God sees that we take that act of faith when we walk into a church, whether it be to light a candle, whether it be to sit in the back pew because you're taking a break from work or from the family or you're on your way to the grocery store and you pop into a church, uh, the Catholic Church, and, and you just sit there. It's, it could be, um, you know, it, it, like I said, no service may be happening or it could be completely dark, but the church is open. And some churches are open during the day for this. Uh, or they have chapels, but nevertheless, it's that, it's that almost that mountaintop experience. Like, Lord, I'm here, I'm away from everything, I'm in your presence. And even if it's for one minute or ten or twenty minutes that you're there, can be a moment of healing and a moment of grace. So this vision was given to Peter, James, and John to strengthen their faith for the time when they would be scandalized by Jesus' death on the cross. And it is interesting that the scriptures do not mention that these three share this experience with the other apostles after Jesus was crucified. It's not written in scripture, but although Peter does speak about it after Pentecost in his second letter, in his second, sorry, it it was written by in the, in uh, Peter uh, in his second letter. So why did, why did the Lord choose this place, this mountain to be transfigured? Well, throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, God has often chosen the heights of the mountains to give a message to his people. To name a few, Mount Horeb, or also called Mount Sinai, um, and Mount Nebo, located in in Egypt and in Galilee, Mount Tabor and the Mount of Beatitudes in Jerusalem, and the Mount of Olives. So Mount Sinai is where God chose Moses to lead his people out of Egypt to the promised land. It was there that God spoke to Moses from the burning bush and revealed his name as I Am. It was here um, on Mount Sinai that God gave Moses the Ten Commandments and gave instructions on how to lead his people. It was on Mount Carmel where Elijah defeated Baal, the pagan God and the false prophets, and God revealed himself to Elijah as a still, small voice as he passed by the place where Elijah was there on Mount Carmel. In the Bible, the mountain is regarded as a place where God reveals himself. It would be an interesting personal, um, spiritual exercise to look through the scriptures and look up the various mountain experiences from the Old Testament to the New, as I mentioned, Mount Sinai, Mount Nebo, uh, Mount, Mount Tabor, Mount of Beatitudes, Mount of Olives, and what happened at these places. Uh, the location of Mount Tabor now rises about oh, 1,930 feet above, above sea level, or about a third of a mile high. Mount Tabor stands alone in this large plain surrounded by the upper and lower Galilee region. The Galilee region includes the Sea of Galilee and several miles around that. And it is only a few miles from Nazareth. So considered a sacred mountain since ancient times, Tabor was a place of Canaanite worship before entering fully into the history of the chosen people uh, through some of the most ancient stories of the Bible. And it is recalled by the psalmist to illustrate the magnificence of God in creation. Mount Tabor was a boundary marker for the Israelite tribes in the north and and famous for the victories of Deborah and Barak against the commander of the Canaanite army, which is mentioned in the Old Testament, specifically in the book of Judges. So let's continue with these Mount Tabor moments. Now, this moment of glory is one that Peter wants to savor forever. Scripture scholars will tell us that Jesus provides his closest disciples this experience so to prepare them for the impending horror of the passion. But despite that, don't you also strongly identify with Peter's desire to remain in a place that he knows is good? I believe we all experience that at different times. We all long to be in a place of fullness, and thus we often cling to our Mount Tabor moments. You know, Peter certainly wanted to remain in that place and in that moment with Jesus. He offered to make tents and expresses his desire to remain there. 
And these are moments when we experience the presence of the Lord, moments where we might proclaim we are happy enough to die, moments where the only thing we long for is more of what we are receiving. Perhaps you have heard the expression of, uh, I had a mountaintop experience. Well, it is referring to this moment. Now let's look at um, Mount from Tabor to Calvary. And I forgot to mention, we were talking about mountains. You know, Calvary was a, a, a hill, but, you know, a small mountain in Jerusalem. And so let's look at that. As Peter, James, and John encountered the Lord of glory, they were being prepared to see the apparent failure of the cross. In the bleakness of Good Friday and Holy Saturday, they had the small hope of the transfiguration remaining within their hearts and their memory. The same is true with the different moments of grace that the Lord provides for us. Whether it is in priceless moments with family, breathtaking moments in creation, or deep experiences of prayer, the Lord pours out his blessings with the intention of equipping us for the journey ahead, for what we need ahead. We may be in the journey ahead. We may be reminded of the Lord's Calvary experience as we undergo our own trials and difficulties, remembering his promise Come to me, and I will give you rest. In other words, he begs us to come to him for the strength and guidance we need. Now, just as Peter said yes to Jesus a hundred times before the revelation of Mount Tabor, so we too must say yes to Jesus in the daily mundane acts of being faithful. It sometimes means A yes in sorrow or pain, but each yes makes straight the way of the Lord in our individual lives. Let us thank the Lord for the Mount Tabor moments and the Calvary moments. He is using all of it to transfigure us into faithful disciples who will follow him from Tabor to Calvary to heaven. And speaking of Calvary, I'd like to present a parallel between two events in the Lord's life. This is from a homily that uh, I heard presented by a Catholic priest, a a very holy Catholic priest uh, at Mass uh, on Mount Tabor, at Mount Tabor. And I'll explain in a moment, the church, there is a church built on the top of Mount Tabor. It's incredible. It's a Catholic uh, church, of course. And uh, so we often spend lots of time here on Mount Tabor because it's quite an effort to get on top. And I'll explain that in a moment as well. But this, um, this, the mass we attended, this priest gave this excellent homily. And I want to share the insights from that. It's a parallel between uh, Tabor and Calvary. At the Transfiguration, we have three disciples, Peter, James, and John. At the Crucifixion, we also find three disciples, Mary, the mother of Jesus, John, the beloved disciple, and Mary Magdalene. At the transfiguration, Jesus takes others. He takes the three. Jesus is elevated on the mountain, on Mount Tabor. Mount Tabor is a private revelation to Peter, James, and John, and so Jesus' garments are illuminated. They're turned, they, they shine as, as a bright light. Jesus is glorified, and two saints stand beside Jesus, Moses and Elijah. And then the Father's voice professes his son. Let's look at Mount Calvary, the crucifixion. Jesus is taken by others. Jesus is elevated on the cross on Mount Calvary. And Mount Calvary, it's a public spectacle It's not private, and it's not so, and it it isn't glorious in the sense of the response of of the people on Mount Calvary at the time of the crucifixion. His garments are stripped off. Jesus is shamed. And there are two criminals crucified beside Jesus. And the father sustains his son. The putting together of all this is something that only God himself can do by the power of the Holy Spirit in the figure of Jesus of Nazareth. The putting together of the glory of his transfiguration 
and his crucifixion on the cross is part of our Christian story. It's the glory and the cross. It's the glory and the cross. It's the Old Testament and the New Testament coming together in a way. Moses and Elijah with Jesus at the Transfiguration, Mary the Mother of God, Mary Magdalene with the beloved disciples on Calvary. The Mount Tabor moments, those God moments, can help us make our way through life. And I like to add to this that, you know, it, it, it should remind us of Mother Church because you know, I often say, well, you know, life is the cross. It's the, it's the, the sweetness and, and the sorrow of the cross. Because in the midst, you know, the church allowed is, um, I heard, I was reading a book um, recently, and the book was about someone's journey th- uh, of their conversion and in, in, back into the church. And this author was describing the church as being uh, as light as, you know, helping us carry our yoke and being very uh, healing and consoling, but also the cross in the sense that the church is there to help us in all those moments and reminding us, like during Lent, that we can begin again, reminding us that as we begin again, Christ gives us new life through his death, through his passion and death. Uh, and of course, Easter, Easter season, the resurrection, we begin again. Isn't that just wonderful? So, you know, that's why when we look at the scripture stories, they're so, it's so rich, it's so much. We, we hear them over and over again, year after year, or month after month, and, um, it, you know, in the liturgical calendar when they're being proclaimed at Mass, or if you're in a Bible study, you hear it often, or when you're reading it personally and prayerfully reading the scriptures. Don't you agree that each time when you read a scripture, maybe, you know, two months later, you read the same uh, passage and, and receive something com- either different or even richer? And this is the Holy Spirit. The word is alive. It pierces, it pierces bone and marrow, it says in Hebrews. It, it pierces heart and soul. And this is, this is the good news. So let's let's journey on to the top of Mount Tabor, where a large church is called the Basilica of the, of the Transfiguration. It was built to commemorate the Transfiguration of Jesus before the three apostles, Peter, James, and John. Now, this church was built in the 20th century by the Franciscans of the Holy Land under the architect leadership of Antonio Berluzzi. And, of course, you've heard us say often, and my husband, even Tom, when he's been with me, you've heard us say often the Franciscans of the Holy Land are the custodians of the Holy Land. Thanks to St. Francis of Assisi, the Franciscans have been in the Holy Land since the 13th century, and they have been caring for all the holy sites related to the, um, well, of course, obviously the Bible, but the Lord Jesus and the Blessed Virgin Mary and, of course, St. Joseph, the Holy Family. So this architect, Antonio Berluzzi, built this basilica. But I have to pause a moment here to say something about this amazing man. I admire Antonio Berluzzi. He was an an Italian architect, of course, the name Berluzzi. (laughs) He consecrated his life to the Lord, remaining a layman, a layperson. He had an extraordinary conversion experience and decided to give the Lord his gifts and talents as an architect under the direction of the Franciscans. He built 19 churches, hospitals, schools in the Holy Land, and restored six churches, including the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem. Berlusi wrote, in, uh, wrote, In Palestine, every holy place has a direct reference to a definite mystery of the life of Jesus Christ. I love that. It is only natural then to avoid the natural, excuse me, the general type of architecture, which constantly repeats the same word and instead shape the art so that it expresses the feeling called forth by that mystery. In this way, the faithful entering a sanctuary will easily be able to reconstruct in their own minds the gospel story and to concentrate their meditation on thoughts appropriate to the mystery created there. Those are the words of Berluzzi, 
This is an architect, a Catholic architect who gave his life to God and his whole mission, his work, to build churches in the Holy Land for the, for the reason so that the person visiting the Holy Site can enter into the mystery of that, area, of that site um, related to the scriptures. Berluzzi wanted to establish the basic religious concept of the holy place and tailor the architecture to it. We've seen it throughout the Holy Land, and you're going to hear about it and see it in your mind now and in a moment. Antonio Berluzzi died in 1960 in Jerusalem. He lived a prayerful life, closely connected with the Franciscans. And in my opinion, he was an extraordinary man. He focused his attention to the tiniest detail, both for the architecture and the decoration of the buildings. And, you know, I, one of those details, and, and, and this, every time we, he built several churches in the Holy Land, when we lead our pilgrim groups, I remind pilgrims about Antonio Berluzzi, and of course I introduce him to the pilgrims, uh, like, as I did just now very briefly, and, and as we enter the church that he built, I point out some of the details of this incredible spiritual architecture, architect who wanted to build according to the um, scripture story related to that specific site. For instance, in designing the Church of the Transfiguration on Mount Tabor, he built it with three domes, one to the left over the Chapel of Moses, and one to the right covers the chapel of Elijah, and the main one in the middle covers the main altar dedicated to Jesus Christ. Well, these three chapels within the building is to commemorate the three tents mentioned by Peter in the Gospels when he said, let us build three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Before entering the church and describing it to you, you may be thinking, well, how does one get up to this mountain? Of course, our Lord and the three disciples that went with him walked up the mountain, and Tom and I both have done that as well, taken a little over an hour to reach the top. And just like the early pilgrims who had to climb 4,300 steps cut into the rock slope to reach the top, well, we sort of like just went through the woods. Um, we couldn't really find those steps, but we went up and it was an experience. And we kept thinking, wow, Lord, how did you do this with the three? But, you know, the Lord walked all over the Galilee region and, and to Jerusalem through Samaria and then back to the Galilee region where he would often stay at Peter's house in Capernaum. So, um, you know, he certainly, and, you know, time, and, and he had time. He wanted to take Peter, James, and John away to spend some time. And, and so, indeed, you know, it was just incredible to have that experience. And not today, of course, there is a narrow road for small vehicles and, and taxi vans to take visitors and groups of pilgrims up to the mountain on this narrow, winding road with hairpin turns <laughs> before reaching the top. And as you do drive up, you see beyond the region, below, below the mountain valley, uh, the region is Nazareth. You can see a bit of Nazareth. It's just incredible. The, that whole region is beautiful. Um, the Church of the Transfiguration. So as we appear, as we walk to the front of the church, before we do, there are ruins of an ancient monastery. Uh, the monastery that was built during the Crusades, and there are planters of flowers in the midst of the ruins, quite unique to the eye to see beautiful, colorful flowers and plants in the midst of ruins. Uh, as you enter uh, so as well, that whole courtyard or the the monastery uh, ruins are, there's a bust of Pope Paul VI to commemorate his visit to the Holy Land and to Mount Tabor in 1964. And by the way, Pope Paul VI died on August the 6th, which is the Feast of the Transfiguration. And we do see a bronze plaque of, guess who? Antonio Berluzzi, the architect. We definitely need to remember this great man for the incredible work he did in building this basilica on Mount Tabor. So when you, again, when you travel with us on pilgrimage to the Holy Land, you experience the holy sites. Our, our pilgrim groups spend a half a day on Mount Tabor. It's easy to do so. The time to drive up the mountain, the time to be with the Lord, have Holy Mass. Then we also give p pilgrims time for silent prayer, a scripture reading, and 
often time for the sacrament of reconciliation and then simply just walking through the grounds, enjoying the remarkable view of the valley below and remembering exactly what happened there. Um, so, again, people benefit from our 30 years of organizing and leading pilgrimages. And, you know, when you travel with the experts, with people who care, when you choose Pilgrim Center of Hope, um, Ministry of Pilgrimage. Let's, now, let's enter the church. Immediately, you see a beautiful color mosaic of the Transfiguration high above the main sanctuary. It captures your eye. It's beautiful. It's very colorful. Uh, the great mosaic above the above shows the three disciples awestruck at the sight at the sight of Jesus in glory, accompanied by Moses and Elijah. It's a it's a beautiful mosaic, very detailed. The face of Jesus in the design is lifted as if, as if he is in conversation with God the Father, and it's full of gentleness and peace. While Peter, James, and John are bent low with their arms extended over their face so as to shield from the bright light radiating from Christ. Can you, can you imagine that? That's all in the mosaic. So you can already imagine how beautiful this is. And you can understand our, our famous Antonio Berluzzi wanted to extend the details of what it, might, what it might have been like to have been there. Gazing upon this unique mosaic, one tends to place themselves in the scripture story. And speaking of that tiniest details, as I was coming, uh, as, as I told you before the break, there was going to be a little detail. Well, here it is. Antonio Berluti designed it so that the sunlight would pass through an alabaster window on the side of the building of the basilica directly on the face of Jesus in this mosaic above the altar on the Feast of the Transfiguration, which falls on August the 6th. Now, that is so uh, incredible and well planned by this genius, Antonio Berluzzi, that he would have this, you know, alabaster window uh, on the side of the basilica is where the sun would come in at a certain time, shine on the face of Jesus. Incredible. So it gives you a, a more insight about this, what I consider a holy man, Antonio Berluzzi. Now, the main sanctuary. Um, above, yes, there's the altar, and then below, there's another altar because there's steps that go up to the high altar, and then below, there is a lower altar where you t walk down some steps, and and often our pilgrim group have mass at that altar. It's quite unique because, well, uh, there's around the there's a wooden floor in front of the altar covering part of the ancient Byzantine church that was built there uh, in the five in the fifth. 6th century, 500s. And then there's a glass opening to see where the very stone of the mountain itself. So that's why we like to have mass there because you're actually as close as possible to the original top of Mount Tabor where tradition tells us the Lord was when he was transfigured. And to the left of this altar, of the sanctuary, there um, there's an altar with a Blessed Sacrament. There's there's actually three altars. One is has the Blessed Sacrament, so pilgrims can spend time with Jesus in His Eucharistic presence. To the right of the sanctuary is another altar dedicated to Saint Francis of Assisi. Of course, the Franciscans are the ones that built this church. So, you know, you know, can you think? Can you imagine? Here you are standing on Mount Tabor, and then not just a few feet away, there's an altar with the Blessed Sacrament where Jesus is truly present in the Eucharist in His Eucharist. So Jesus is still there. I mean, he was there physically when he walked the land of Palestine, the Holy Land, and he's still there in his Eucharistic presence. The Feast of the Transfiguration, of course, is August the 6th in our liturgical calendar, and the local Catholic community who live in Cana and in Nazareth, which is only a few miles from Mount Tabor, take opportunities to visit this holy place on foot. Let us, and you know, um, we know many of the local families there, and especially a, a beautiful Catholic family, very devoted to the faith, who are parishioners in Cana, the church in Cana. And they related the story to me about, uh, to my husband Tom and I, about this youth group that goes on pilgrimage every year on foot, led by the Franciscan friars, who are, of course, the, the priest, the, the, the pastor of that church in Cana. And every year they lead this week-long retreat for youth, and 
and they walk up to Mount Tabor, they climb it, and they, they camp out, and they have picnic, and they have adoration, and some spiritual uh, exercises, but then they, the Franciscan friars speak to them. It, it's a really, I can imagine how beautiful these, these young people, with their energy, would walk and climb and then camp as they're adoring Jesus on Mount Tabor with the Franciscans. So there's a story of this young man, uh, and I like to share this. This it's called I call it the miracle of on Mount Tabor. A young man went. Um, well, this he wanted to go, but he had had a recent accident and which caused his right arm to be paralyzed. And so his friends were encouraging him to go um, to this retreat with them, to join them, and he was hesitant and very shy and. I'm really embarrassed because as they related the story, this young man had suffered the accident, losing the use, losing the use of one arm, didn't want to be embarrassed by having difficulty carrying his backpack, tying his shoes. So his friends insisted he go and they promised they would help him. So he did. He joined the group. And when they arrived at Mount Tabor, the first thing that the Franciscans did was have, have a mass of thanksgiving followed by adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. Well, the Franciscans used music and guided the group to look at Jesus at the Blessed Sacrament. They kept inviting the youth, look at him, see him, speak to him. So this young man, who had the use of the only one arm, was kneeling and adoring Jesus in the Eucharist when he later describes what he saw. He saw the face of Christ in the, in the host and a voice telling him to move closer to the monstrance. Immediately, he felt warmth in his arm and then noticed that he could use his arm without a problem or without pain. And he began to shout with joy that Jesus healed him. I, I love that story. And, you know, it, it's you know, why should we doubt that Jesus can still heal today? Jesus healed that young man. His life changed and he was able to use both his arms normally. Can, can we relate to this young man? Oh, I think we all can. Haven't we often said to ourselves or others, oh, I'm not worthy to serve or I'm not, I cannot get involved or I have no gifts to offer. I'm embarrassed. I don't have experience. I don't know if I can do this. Well, that young man felt all that. And yet God knew what that man was going through. And, and he used his friends to encourage them and, and, and so brought him forth to a healing experience. One of the Franciscans commented about these walks by saying, we get close to God and enter into a deeper relationship with him. These journeys are only seven days, but they support the life of the faith throughout all the year. And again, we may not go on these kind of journeys for a week climbing Mount Tabor or to the Holy Land, but we can have our own experience, mountaintop experience, our own retreat or a time, whether not whether it be a day or an hour a week with Jesus. I think this is what's so beautiful. What's important is that we have some structure to include the spiritual uh, growth uh, for our lives as we do grow intellectually to learn to be professionals in our work or in our vocation or as a domestic engineer, <laughs> as women who work at the home. You know, they still need to be very clever and wise and having a structure for the family. We need structure for our spiritual lives as well. So what about us today? Let's look at four points we can learn from the transfiguration. And this meditation is taken from a Middle Eastern Catholic priest about the experience of Mount Tabor and how it can relate to us today. And there's four points. First, Jesus takes the initiative. Jesus took Peter, James, and John. Anytime we are moved to pray, it is always the Lord who prompts us. He takes us into that desire to pray. Jesus initiates conversations with people throughout the Gospels. Haven't you ever felt like spending some time in quiet meditation, thinking about God and speaking to Him? These are what we call moments of grace, our Lord prompting you to draw near to Him. It's always His grace acting in our hearts that draws close to Him. So first, Jesus takes that initiative. He prompts us. Second, Jesus leads us, uh, leads them to a high mountain. If you've ever hiked or taken a, a walk up a hill, the greatest moment is when you reach the summit of the mountain or the top of a hill to experience the beauty all around you or what you accomplished. 
This is what prayer is supposed to be, allowing God to take us more and more into his presence, to experience his beauty and his love, to lift us toward God. Just like climbing a mountain or one cannot just give up and turn around. You've already begun and you are convinced to continue. God never leaves us. He walks with us. And when we allow God to take us more into his providence, his care, we will discover his presence in a real way. So that was the second point. Jesus leads us up to a mountain. He, he won't, he'll, he'll walk with us in our efforts. Third, they hear God speak. A voice came from the cloud. Prayer is not simply about us talking to God. It's about allowing ourselves to hear the voice of the Lord speak to us. This is where silence is important. We don't walk into a doctor's office when we have an appointment and begin telling him about our ailments and then say, well, that's it. I have to go now. And the doctor would respond, wait, you haven't allowed me to give you an answer, a remedy. (laughs) When we sometimes do this with God, we may catch ourselves treating him this way. So to take a moment to be in silence with God, that's the third point. God speaks to us, and silence is so important. Fourth, Jesus touches them and tells them to rise. I like that. Jesus touches them. I mean, I would, wouldn't you want to be touched by Jesus? Let's recall that verse from Matthew uh, chapter 17. Uh, Jesus came, uh, sorry, from Mark. Jesus came and touched them, saying, Rise and do not be afraid. And when the disciples raised their eyes, they saw no one else but Jesus alone. Jesus touched the three, Peter, James, and John. They were overwhelmed by the experience. And through the centuries, Jesus continues to touch believers who are open and have humble, contrite hearts so that he can awaken awaken in them the reality of his presence. We too are called to have a humble, contrite heart. There were many saints who were kings and queens and leaders and uh, clergy, religious, lay people, engineers, scientists that were incredible people in the world and, and yet with a great virtue of humility because of their contrite heart and their willingness to approach Jesus and allowing Jesus to touch them. And so uh, that is really... Jesus touching them, telling them to rise. Let us allow Jesus to touch us in prayer and to awaken us to the reality of what surrounds us. You know, through the scriptures, we also are witnesses of this transfiguration event. Um, We know that the word of God is true and given to us for our own sanctification. If we would often read the word of God and reflect on the promises he gives us, we should be able to avoid discouragement. He promises he will be with us always and will give us the grace we need for every circumstances. Every circumstance. You know, some I've had people tell me, well, you know, I'm not involved with a Bible study. I don't know. I'm not familiar with the scriptures. I'm not too sure how to start or where to start. You know, well, I often suggest, if if that's the case, that to um, to look at the liturgical readings. You know, every day the church has um, scripture readings for we call them the mass readings. You know, the scripture readings that pertain to the liturgy um, of the word each day from the mass, and these are sometimes even printed in parish bulletins. But if you are not able to get to a parish bulletin either on the website on their website or or actually picking one up at the church, you can look up the liturgical calendar. There's many resources that you can do that through and find what the gospel of the day is and and begin that way. Read the gospel of the day prayerfully, slowly, quietly, and ask the Lord, the Holy and ask the Holy Spirit to give you that insight and to say, Lord, I want to. I want to climb this mountain with you. I want to enter this word with you. Please touch me. Please uh, invite me to enter into an insight of what you want to to speak to me about in this word. I've and I've had that experience where I've done that and I do this and 
I really, um, and there's times when you think, well, I certainly seems like it's pretty dry. I'm not really getting much here, but that's okay. You've made an act of faith. And already that's given you grace because God knows that you've made an effort. And when you make an effort, there's fruit. And so we can walk away by still saying, thank you, Lord. Thank you for being with me. And then who knows? You know, we have a conscience that when we read the word of God, it may not be right at that moment, you know, grasping our our mind, but our conscience, you know, our soul is is taking that. Because remember we said earlier how I said that the word of God is alive. It pierces bone and marrow, as it says in Hebrew, pierces mind and soul, that we will receive well, we, we will receive something maybe later in the day. We'll be reminded, oh, I remember hearing that. Or, Lord, thank you for reminding me of that word. It, it's incredible how if we are consistent in doing this on a daily basis, or at least try on a daily basis, there will be so much um, insight for you. And a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's, it's, an, it's actually embracing that relationship with the Lord by walking closer with, you know, with the Lord in, in his word. So this is Journeys of Hope. We're in the Galilee region, this theme, Mount Tabor, the Basilica of the Transfiguration, built by the Franciscans in the 1900s by an architect uh, the Franciscans chose this uh, Italian architect, Antonio Berluzzi, to build this magnificent church that has three domes to signify, to commemorate the three tents that Peter said we, they should build, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and of course, one for Jesus. And today, you see this incredible church with the three domes, the three chapels, the main sanctuary with that beautiful mosaic of, of that whole scripture story before you. Jesus transfigured the three, Peter, James, and John at the feet of Jesus. Uh, incredible, very colorful. And remember what we said on August the 6th, on the Feast of the Transfiguration, there is a light that comes through the alabaster window on the side of the church that shines on the face of Jesus on the mosaic. And by the way, on August the 6th every year, the local people of the area, the local Catholics, um, they walk or by vehicle go to Mount Tabor. And a lot of times the bishop, well, one of the bishops of the Latin Patriarchate, which is the Diocese of Jerusalem, will join and have uh, the people of God and will have Mass on August the 6th. So on August the 6th, remember, Mount Tabor, remember the people of the Holy Land walking to Mount Tabor as you are, where you are, celebrating the Feast of the Transfiguration. (laughs) As a tradition, the jewel for the journey that we like to give you this week is actually from a woman who is a Palestinian Catholic living in the Galilee region. Her name is Rabab, and she says, Being here enables us to understand that we need to detach ourselves from material things, to look to heaven as earthly things often separate us from Jesus. It is no coincidence that Jesus chose this mountain for his transfiguration. And so here is a local Catholic giving you a jewel for the journey from Mount Tabor. Well, I thank you for joining me on this journey of hope, experience to Mount Tabor. Join us each week as we visit a, a, ver- a different site and discover that site, but also how it, we can, as I said earlier, relate to us. But it, the significance, there's always a teaching to these places. Um, all over the world, we're so blessed to have all these holy sites. And we may not en- see any of them physically, but we can see them through our uh, learning about them, discovering them, and then seeing why these places today can help me, even though I've never been to, to these holy sites. So again, this is the purpose, the whole mission of Journey of Hope, Journeys of Hope. Join me in prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At the Transfiguration, Father, you show Jesus in glory a glimpse of what his disciples would see in his risen life. Bless us and our humanity with an awareness of your presence, leading us to share in your divine love, even in our daily struggle. 
Help us to deepen our knowledge of your written word and your promises so that we may always live in hope. This we ask in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior, in whom we love, in whom we believe, in whom we adore. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We've come to the end of our journey for today. Thank you again. This is a production of Pilgrim Center of Hope, and we are here to guide people to Christ and the church. Learn more about our threefold ministry of evangelization, of pilgrimages, of conferences, and outreach. Visit pilgrimcenterofhope.org or call us at 210-521-3377. 210-521-3377. Because we are a pilgrim people, strive to live your journey each day with hope. Until next time, may God bless you. Journeys of Hope, a production of Pilgrim Center of Hope, guiding people to Christ. Visit our website at pilgrimcenterofhope.org.